welcome back to the discussion on digital filters uh, in this pre recorded lecture we'll be <coughs> covering the rest of the remaining parts of this chapter uh, if you remember when we finished in the previous class this was the last topic that we discussed that is how information is represented in signals we talked about uh, the time domain information and information that are present in the frequency domain and near at the end we said that step and frequency responses are these two are the ones that we'll be focusing on in the next class that is in this particular uh, lecture we'll be focusing on these two things that are the step responses and the frequency responses so we also talked about uh, briefly about uh, time domain parameters and what kind of parameter uh, and that is what is going to uh, we are going to talk about now the time domain parameters so in the previous class i just mentioned this thing that time domain parameters are mainly uh, related with the step response okay so what are these parameters so that is our first topic of discussion today uh, the first thing that you you might be thinking right now is why we are considering the step response instead of the impulse response because in all the previous cases we have been considering impulse response as the most important feature of a system a system is defined by the impulse response the h because that is what we convolute with to get the output of a system but now when we are discussing a system as a digital filter we uh, in the time domain we are putting more focus on the step response instead of the impulse response so why is that the first thing is that uh, that is our question that is why uh, it, it is not directly obvious to us why step response is of more concern than uh, impulse response in the time domain so the answer this lies in the fact uh, the answer lies in how human mind understands and processes uh, information so i think i already talked about this in the previous class just mentioned this thing how step response uh, uh, also in what uh, the previous to previous class i mentioned that step response is like an integration it is obtained uh, as an integration from so it's like an integral of uh, the impulse response okay so whatever the impulse response is uh, if the basic impulse response that is if it is a delta function its corresponding step response will be this the zero step i mean at zero we have a one so this is the most basic one if you have an impulse response like this its corresponding step function uh, step response would, would have been this and if the impulse response is uh, the h function is anything different from this the corresponding step response will also be always uh, the integral of this so now the thing is if this is an integral if the step step function is an integral of the delta function similarly the step response is an integral of the impulse response now how does it help us to uh, obtain more information in the time domain so the thing is that how human mind understands and processes information what do we mean by this the thing is uh, as an example if we are given a signal of some unknown origin and we are asked to analyze it the first thing we will do uh, is divide the signal into regions of similar characteristics and uh, this is just i mean common sense if you have a signal where there are some small amplitudes suppose there are some small amplitudes some perturbations like this and then there is a spike like this and then there are some other small amplitudes and then multiple spikes so how would you actually uh, process this signal in your mind what will what will you realize from this signal you will in, uh, in your mind you will automatically divide it into regions of similar characteristics and by similar characteristics we mean uh, regions where suppose uh, we can divide we can create one division here that means there were some noise here but no significant values were obtained in this part but there is a significant value here so this might mean something uh, for now what it might mean is actually dependent on the application from where we got this signal if it is the heart rate signal then that will have some in, some meaning if it is some other kind of signal like a seismology or uh, earth vibration signal that is that will have some other meaning but the main thing is that uh, this peak will mean something again we'll have another region this will be the noise 
okay so this won't mean much of anything this small perturbation range and here we have a double peak so this will uh, again mean another thing so this is how we would normally think about a signal when we see it when we look at its plot uh, through our eyes uh, so how so this is how a human mind will think about a signal that is what we are trying to translate uh, when we are trying to process this signal using a machine we are trying to segment perform segmentation on the signal so uh, this segmentation is accomplished by identifying the points that separate the regions so here there is a particular point where we have a separation of uh, signal characteristics here we can think that there was low amplitude here and suddenly it became high amplitude here also here is another separation why a high amplitude suddenly became low okay so here we were getting high amplitudes and suddenly we got low amplitudes so this is how we can find the points of separation this is one point of separation this is another point of separation so this is how we can find the points of separation so the step function is the one that allows us to find the points of separation this is the purest way of representing a division between two dissimilar regions so the corresponding step response of a signal would give uh, would give us regions of dissimilarity okay so that is why we are <coughs> using the step response instead of the impulse response so the step here we just set the step function not the response the step function is the purest way of representing a division between two dissimilar regions the step response in turn is important because it describes how the dividing lines are being modified by the filter so in the time domain uh, the filter will work on the input so this uh, i mean what what are we actually doing we are convoluting with the impulse response of the filter but after the uh, convolution what actually will happen is that the filter will modify the input signal uh, along the dividing lines i mean where where you find the di uh, difference of different regions <coughs> these are these are the regions where we will have some specific work okay so that is why even though we are convoluting with the impulse response when we are uh, tuning the filter we are tuning the step response not the impulse response these time domain parameters that we just said that we will be discussing today these time domain parameters are these parameters are not on the impulse response these parameters are on the step response so you will be seeing right now what i mean so to distinguish events in a signal the duration of the step response must be shorter than the spacing of the events so uh, right off the bat we have one particular uh, important parameter in the time domain that is the duration of the step uh, the corresponding step response of the impulse response that we are convoluting with this is the impulse response that we are convoluting with in order to perform filtration or to filtering so if you want to perform filtering of the input signal using uh, by convoluting with the impulse response this this impulse response has a corresponding step response okay so that corresponding step response suppose that is uh, u so that corresponding step response should have a shorter uh, the duration of the step response should be shorter that is okay so the duration of the step this is one important parameter the duration of the corresponding step so this one's duration by duration you'll just see what i mean by duration uh, the other thing is called is uh, rise time okay uh, so this is uh, an important parameter by tuning this we can control what will happen in the after the convolution okay so the most common way to specify the rise time is to quote the number of samples between 10 percent and 90 percent amplitude level so this is what the rise time means the duration of the step is basically how much time is needed for the step to go from 10 percent of the amplitude to 90 percent of the amplitude okay so you might be think uh, if you think of the step signal as gradual instead of instantaneous it was gradual like this in that case uh, suppose this is the lowest point and this is the highest point highest amplitude okay so this is the highest uh, signified as plus and this is the lowest point so in that case uh, this is the 10 percent of the lowest and this is the 90 percent of the highest you can think just suppose that this is the 10 percent of the lowest and this is the 90 percent of the highest so in order to reach from here to here the time that took 
uh, along the time axis this is the time axis okay so this is the time axis uh, uh, in order to reach from here to here the time that was needed this time that was needed this is called the rise time okay so this is the rise time so that is what is basically mentioned here uh, and this is one of the parameters the we and you can already guess uh, if you instead think of instead of thinking about the time if you think about this think of this in terms of width this width uh, instead of thinking of this as time a time difference you can think of it as a width so this width is one of the important parameters of uh, the step response the uh, this, uh, the width of the step so instead of thinking about the duration of the step you can also call it the width of the step so this width of the step is one of the important time domain parameters so we have just covered one of them one of the time domain parameters uh, here in this figure you'll see uh, examples of all three time domain parameters that are the rise time uh, the overshoot uh, and phase linearity we'll be talking about these two uh, very shortly but here you can see that they have given a kind of uh, comparison between them an exam example comparison that if you have something like this if the rise time is something like this then this is a poor filter if the rise time is something like this then this is a good filter so a good filter will have a fast step response that means its rise time will be its width will be small if its width is larger like this for example this is you can think that this is the 10 percent and this is the 90 percent so you can think of the width as something like this big and here you can think of it as very narrow okay so this is better having a narrow uh, step is better than a wide step and we'll also be talking about this uh, right now so we'll be coming back to this figure again in figure c and d we see the next parameter after uh, the rise time which is the overshoot okay so c and d this one shows the overshoot and one shows the bad overshoot bad kind of overshoot that we can have the other is the good kind of overshoot that is no overshoot so overshoot is like <clears throat> another parameter in the time domain uh, among the time domain parameters and what we want to do is we want to generally remove overshoot from our time to, uh, step response if the step response has overshoot then it is considered as bad and if it does not have overshoot then that is uh, characteristics of a good filter so it, uh, what they basically are saying is that it must be eliminated because it changes the amplitude of the samples in the signal that is if it has overshoot in the uh, step response then if you perform convolution with this corresponding impulse response the actual value of the input that is x will change okay so what we want to do is we want to perform filtering by using this operation convolution operation we simply want to perform convolution operation to do filtering but we want the input signal x to remain as x we do not want any change in x but if we uh, if, it, if the corresponding step response has overshoot in its plot so that signifies that it is its corresponding impulse response won't be uh, the actual impulse response it will be uh, when you perform this it will perform as if instead of getting the actual y we'll get some modified y some samples will have some errors so that's we what we want to avoid for, for that we want to avoid the overshoot because otherwise we'll get a different y instead of the actual y some samples in y will change uh, so that is why we want to avoid uh, overshoot and finally the last parameter that we want to tune is the uh, phase linearity okay so phase linearity means that the corresponding time domain uh, in the time domain plot the upper half of the step response should be symmetrical with the lower half in the previous chapter in i think the uh, ft properties fourier transform properties we already talk talked about this that if the time domain signal is uh, symmetrical with respect to a particular uh, point then this corresponding phase in the uh, figure, uh, Fourier transform uh, counterpart will have the phase to be linear. For example, if it is symmetrical around sample 0 or n by 2, 
any symbol that is symmetrical around n by 2 is already symmetrical around 0. We talked about this before in the previous chapter. So suppose this is n by 2 and it's got a, uh, suppose a signal is something like this, symmetrical around n by 2 or something like uh, this, symmetrical around 0 or n by 2, you can think of it in this way. Okay, so if it is symmetrical like this, then its corresponding uh, frequency domain will have the phase the phase plot to be linear and it will be zero phase actually not just linear it will be horizontal at zero uh, but if it is not symmetrical around n by 2 or 0 if it is symmetrical but in a different point suppose instead of having this at this uh, at n by 2 we can have it here okay so if it is something like that then we will have a linear phase but with a particular degree okay so the basic idea is that the phase will be linear and what we want is the phase to be linear in order for the phase to be linear uh, we want the time domain signal to be symmetric and in case of step response how will it be symmetric a uh, step response can be symmetric if its bottom half is the same as its top half that is its rise part rising part should be same as its uh, Oh, what can I say? It's uh, asymptotic upper part. So at one point it is rising, and at one and at the other half it is getting flat at the top. So these two things, these two portions, should be symmetric. If they are not, then its corresponding phase will be nonlinear. And what we need is we want linear phase. Okay. So the uh, the symmetry. Is necessary because uh, uh, just to get the phase to be linear because the frequency response if, if the phase is not linear then this will modify the uh, just like overshoot this will modify the actual output that we are supposed to get and also the fact that uh, most of our applica uh, applications when we want to apply any kind of filtering we want the filter to be linear so that it just so that it can be applied in any order otherwise a nonlinear filter uh, if you apply a nonlinear filter, then some things uh, are different, as we know. M uh, most of the theorems that we uh, work with, they say that if something is linear, then we can apply them in any ordering. It doesn't matter. But if something is nonlinear, then we cannot apply them in any ordering. The ordering will start to matter at that point. So that is why in all kinds of operations, we want linearity, because linearity gives us uh, some freedom. But if we apply, if, if we make something as nonlinear, then we lose that freedom. We cannot apply them in any particular order. We have to ap apply them in a specific order. Or also, a lot of other errors might come if we do not maintain linearity. So that is why we want to maintain linearity. And remember that linearity in the frequency domain will be achieved if we par if we keep the time domain as symmetric. Okay. So this is an example of a nonlinear phase, and this is an example of a linear phase. Uh, this is not actually showing the phase this is showing the time domain but if the time domain is like this then its corresponding phase in the frequency domain will be non-linear for this it will be linear it will be something like this or something like this it will be linear uh, either it will have a slope or it will if it is symmetrical around n by 2 such as in this case this is symmetrical around n by 2 obviously right so this is symmetrical uh, around the middle so in that case this will be linear and horizontal at zero but if it is something like this uh, like not at not along n by 2 but still symmetrical uh, then it will be linear still linear something either this or this if it is here or it can be here uh, in, in either of the cases we will have one of these right but if it is something like this some, uh, something that is not symmetrical in that case is uh, corresponding phase if you plot it it won't be something in, in any of these three it will be something like uh, this or you can already guess i mean it's not going to be just linear like this it might be a sine curve cosine curve or any kind of modified curve so that is the basic idea here okay uh, so these three are the uh, time domain parameters that we want to focus on and tuning this we can tune the behavior of the corresponding filter notice that we are tuning the step response but when we are performing the filtering we are not using the step response we are using the impulse response as we have just shown here uh, when we are performing the filtering this is where we are performing the filtering actually we are multiplying uh, not multiplying we are convoluting with the impulse response but when we are tuning the filter we are 
tuning the corresponding step is possible. This is what we are tuning. Okay. So that is all about the time domain uh, parameters. Now we move to the frequency domain parameters. So the frequency domain parameters depends on the frequency response, not the step response. In the previous discussion, we have been talking about the step response, that is U. But now we will be talking about the frequency response. Consider that as F probably. Okay, so uh, uh, F can be obtained as, so, okay. The impulse, the step response U is like an integration. We have said that it is like an integration of the impulse response. Uh, let me show the, okay, H. So we can obtain U from H by integ integral. How can we obtain F? So in our previous chapter, we have already said this, that we can also obtain F from H by DFT or FFT. Okay, so DFT or FFT will give us the, from the impulse response, we can move to the frequency response. Okay, so notice that all of them are actually related somehow. You can obtain U from H, you can also obtain F from H. One is by integral, one is by DFT. Okay, so uh, in case of frequency domain parameters, what we want to do is we want to tune the uh, parameters in F. There are some particular things in F, uh, in this plot you will notice and that is we, what we want to minimize or maximize. So here in F, the things that we want to change, we'll be talking about them shortly. So the first thing is that we have to understand these things, the pass band, stop band and transition band. There are three kinds of bands in the frequency domain. Uh, so the first one, pass band, refers to those frequencies that are passed. Uh, the stop band contains those frequencies that are blocked. Uh, the transition band is in between. Now, uh, fast roll off. So, this is actually the parameter, the first parameter of frequency domain parameter. Roll off. Roll off is the first parameter. And if it is fast, then that means it is good. Uh, fast roll off means that the transition band is very narrow. So, similar to the uh, time domain, in case of time domain, we had this uh, narrow width. It was good. Narrow step a short time to go from 10% to 90%. This was good and this was bad. So similarly, in case of the frequency response, uh, a short time to go to go from passing state to non, uh, from non-passing state to passing state or from passing state to non-passing state. That is good. Okay, so roll off is the time that is needed to go from pass band to stop band uh, or from stop band to pass band. So this is called roll off. And if it is fast, that means that the transition band is narrow. And this is an example of a good filter in the frequency domain. And the division between the pass band and transition band is called the cutoff frequency. So the point at which we start defining that it goes from pass band to transition band, that is called the cutoff frequency. And in most applications, uh, in analog applications, in case of analog, the cutoff frequency is defined as 0.707. Okay, so when the amplitude is reduced to 0 .70, uh, 0 0.707, that is usually considered as the cutoff frequency. But in case of digital filters, this is not, uh, what can I say, this is not fixed. Uh, based on the application, it is common to see 99%, 90%, uh, 70.7%. So there are different kinds of amplitude levels, or even 50, uh, where we define the cutoff frequency. Okay. So... The basic idea is that we can consider, okay, so for example, this is an example of slow roll off where this was, we were passing these frequencies. So up to 0.1, we were passing. Okay, we were passing up to 0.1. So this is the pass band. And after 0.3, we are not passing. So after 0.3, we are not passing. So this is the stop band. So this is the stop band. This is the pass band. And the moment where we start moving from the pass band to the transition band, this is the transition band in between. Okay, so this is the transition band. And here we can define cut the cutoff frequency, the actual frequency at which we will define the cutoff frequency. This may be different based on the application. For analog applications, most of the time what we define is the 70.7 percent, that is 0 0.707. We define this as the cutoff frequency. We define this as the cutoff frequency. FC, suppose, FC. But in case of digital filtering, we can define the FC as different kinds of frequencies, even 50%. Here we can, the middle point 
of the transition then we can define as the cut off frequency okay so that is what is being said here that we can define different points even the middle point is the cut off frequency now uh, the filter must have a fast roll off in order to be considered as a good filter the filter must have a fast roll off uh, for the frequencies to move through the, through the filter unaltered so this is the first okay so this is the first characteristics of a good filter that means the roll off is fast the second characteristics of a good filter uh, in the digital uh, in the uh, frequency domain is that it should have no passband ripple so the passband ripple this is the second uh, parameter frequency domain parameter and uh, uh, how can we determine whether it is uh, having this is good or not having this is good this is what we are going to talk about now so having no passband filter uh, passband ripple is a good characteristic of a filter also to adequately block the stop band frequencies it is necessary to have good stop band attenuation okay so these are the three characteristics that we want to have uh, and this is the third uh, this is actually the third uh, parameter <coughs> that we want to tune <coughs> so having a good stop and attenuation what do we mean by good stop and attenuation we'll be talking about this shortly so all of these are actually showed in this figure uh, in a b we can see examples of bad roll off and good roll off uh, notice that in case of bad roll off we have the transition band to be wide and here we have the transition band to be very narrow okay so here the transition band is narrow uh, in case of ripple the passband ripple we can see that uh, by ripple we mean, the passband ripple we mean that the particular point at which we are passing the frequencies those in that when it moves from the passband to the transition band you can see some ripples okay uh, it, it may happen in this case or it can also happen if the frequency response was something like this the reverse of it so this is a low pass filter because we are passing the low frequencies and not passing the high frequencies these are the high frequencies 0.2 to 0.5 of the sampling frequency these are the high frequencies we are not passing them we having we are having zero here and here we are having one so that means this is a low pass filter and this one that i just drew this is a high pass filter so we can also have ripples here in the uh, in case of the high pass filter we'll have the ripples like this in case of the low pass filter we can have the ripples like this that we can see here so having ripples that means uh, before the transition just before the transition happens there is a ripple when you have something like this this one changes the corresponding frequency domain of the <coughs> actual output that you're supposed to get after filtering but here if you do not have the ripple if you have a flat passband that means that this will minimize the change in the actual y that you're supposed to get and this is a uh, this is the third one the stop and attenuation poor stop and attenuation means that it takes a long time to get to zero okay stop band attenuation that means the point where it uh, reaches the stop band if it reaches it instantaneously then that is an ex example of an ideal filter usually that does not happen that means uh, from low pass so this is a low pass filter so we are thinking that it instantaneously reached zero uh, reach the stop stop band if that is so then that is an ideal filter similarly here if it uh, in case of this is for pass band if it reaches pass band and there is no ripple no ripple then this is an example of an ideal filter but in case but in reality we do not get this we have some ripple in the pass band and in case of stop band we do not reach the stop band instantaneously we reach it in, in some kind of uh, exponentially decaying way we do not reach it like this we reach it like something like exponentially decaying and then we reach the stop band so the thing is the longer it takes to reach the stop band the worse it is and the shorter time it requires for example this one reaches the stop band very quickly uh, even though it takes some a lot of bounces but it reaches eventually so this one is better than this this one almost seems like it doesn't reach the stop band totally it just uh, approximates the stop band okay so these are the three characteristics that we want to tune we want to have fast roll off that means we want to have a uh, uh, kind of narrow width narrow transition width also we want to have no ripple in the pass band and in case of the stop band we want to reach the stop band instantaneously uh, not not instant we cannot reach instantaneously but we want to reach it fast instead of like this uh, slow 
you want to have it fast like this so now the next thing that we want to discuss so these are the three parameters the frequency domain parameters that we want to focus on so now what we want to discuss is uh, okay here is an example of okay, what we were supposed to discuss oh okay now, now our next topic high pass band pass and band reject filters and this figure that we just have this will be useful in this topic okay so there are a lot of things before this if you want you can go through them but these are not uh, totally important but you can go through them if you want our main topic of discussion will be this uh, this will be our next topic the high pass band pass band reject low pass high pass all these things uh, notice that we just need to know the basic fi uh, filter we start from one and then we create the others by combining them in one way or another so all of them the high pass band pass band reject all of these are designed by starting with the low pass filter this is our starting point we will define the low pass filter as the most uh, basic filter and then we will get the others by doing some kind of uh, operation on the low pass filter so the kind of operation that we do there are actually two kinds of operation two kinds of methods for getting the others uh, for example the high pass from the low pass so one is known as the spectral inversion the other is the spectral reversal and these two methods will give us low high pass filter from low pass but they will result in different kinds of high pass filters from the same low pass okay so an example of spectral inversion is given in figure 14.5 so the one that i just skipped this figure i told you that i was going to discuss this after coming to this topic so this is the figure that we are going to focus on for now so this one shows the spectral inversion okay inversion so the basic idea is that this is uh, the high pass what we what do we mean by not high pass we are trying to convert low pass to high pass so what would be the low what would be a low pass filter low pass filter is something that passes the low frequencies right uh, so by passing low frequencies mean that we'll have a one in the low frequency range up to a particular point suppose point one up to point one we are having one and after point one we are gradually trying to stop and at point two we are totally stopping okay so this is an example of a low pass filter in the frequency domain is it, it is easy to understand that this is a low pass filter because uh, just by seeing this you can see that it is if you multiply uh, so remember that a filter how do we perform filtering we perform filtering by performing convolution with the impulse response but if you perform convolution in the time domain what are you actually doing in the frequency domain you are doing multiplication with the corresponding uh frequency response right so this is the frequency response of uh the corresponding frequency domain of this impulse response by performing dft so in the corresponding frequency domain what, what will you be doing okay so this is the small x this is capital x capital x so what you'll be doing is you'll be doing multiplication point by point multiplication with the corresponding frequency domain right so now what should the frequency domain be if you perform multiplication and you want to remove the high high frequencies and only keep the low frequencies what would be the corresponding frequency domain it should be something like this right notice that up to point one of the frequencies uh, from zero to point one all of these all these fractions of frequencies are getting multiplied with one so that means they are remaining in x and the other high frequencies are getting multiplied with zero from point two to point five the uh, 0.5 of the sampling rate frequencies all these uh, frequencies are getting multiplied with zero in x so if you are if you perform that kind of multiplication with the frequencies present in x what will you get you'll get the later values are zero the higher values are zero and the lower values will be something right they will remain as they are now if you perform idft uh, inverse dft the x small x that you'll get that will have the corresponding effect in the time domain so this is the kind of filter that we need in that case so obviously uh, this shows the low pass filter similarly we, the high pass filter what should that be the high pass filter should pass the high high frequencies right so this seems to be like we should have a one in the high frequencies and a zero in the low frequencies so how can we get that 
just notice that this is like a top to bottom if you perform a top to bottom flip of this then we'll be getting a high possibility right so a top to bottom flip in the frequency domain so what we are doing is we are just performing a top to bottom flip of the frequency domain so what will happen in the corresponding time domain so notice that this low pass filters time domain is something like this uh, it has a kind of peak at the uh, middle and in the other regions it is like there is a ripple and it, is, it almost reaches zero so this is an example of a windowed sink we'll be talking about the windowed sink filters in the next chapter so this is a topic of the next chapter this is a special kind of low pass filter a uh, windowed sink okay so this is one kind of low pass filter uh, if it is designed like this its corresponding frequency domain looks something like this this uh, so this is the time domain of the frequency domain so notice that if you perform a top to bottom flip of the frequency domain what we have is in the corresponding time domain this thing this peak gets inverted and there is a, uh, a one is added with the zeroth point with the middle point that is the zeroth point so notice that this peak got inverted all the values got inverted and if it was inverted this should have been something like this the highest point the high this one should have been here but what we have is we have added one with it so this minus 0.2 what should what should this be this should be minus 0.25 right or something like that so this is getting added with one so it will become plus 0.75 uh, or something like this okay so it is here so there is a so the uh, final operation that we did is we performed one minus low pass we get high pass so that is what we basically did we performed an inversion this minus l means an inversion so if you perform minus l so if this is l and if you perform uh if you multiply minus with it it will become this right it will become this this point would have been here but you add one with it plus one so what will happen is this point will go here instead of going to one it will just subtract this point so it will come here okay so this is the final operation that we just that you just did in order to get h when you do it like this it's called spectral inversion that means one minus l you get h or you can also perform one minus h you get l similarly you can get l so this is called spectral inversion okay and in the corresponding frequency domain notice that it will have uh, the effect of top to bottom flipping if you perform one minus something in the time domain notice that the corresponding frequency domain got inverted top to bottom and the other kind of way we can have a high pass filter is by spectral reversal that is our next topic okay so okay so uh, before we go to the spectral reversal let us just summarize the final things that we just did there are two things we did in order to get spectral inversion so the first is change the sign of each sample in the filter kernel so notice that we just perform a minus multiplication with l okay so change the sign of each of the values here and then add one with the zeroth position right uh, second is add one to the sample at the center of symmetry so that is how we perform spectral inversion and what spectral inversion will actually do in the frequency domain we just said said it already it flips the frequency domain uh, frequency response uh, top for bottom in other words it change uh, in other words it changes the filter from low pass to high pass high pass to low pass band pass to band reject or band reject to band pass okay so uh, you can actually get all of this by performing spectral inversion uh, just by performing one minus its corresponding uh, counterpart for example for band pass to band reject you can if you perform one minus band pass you'll get band reject okay if you perform one minus band pass similarly you get band reject similarly okay now we move on to the other method of getting uh, the uh, counterpart filtering from one filter so from low pass to high pass using spectral reversal in this case what will happen is you'll get uh, what we are not exactly we didn't say yet what we did in the time domain but what will happen in this case is that you'll get a flipping of the frequency domain left for right in the previous case what we got is we uh, flipped top to bottom okay if you perform spectral inversion in the previous case you'll see that you got a flipping of top to bottom this thing got flipped top to bottom okay so the band that was here the band was still here 
it was only uh, it only got uh, flipped top for bottom, top to bottom. But now what you are doing is you are flipping left to right. So the band that you got here, this band will come here. Okay, so if you flip it from uh, left to right, mirror it left to right, then this band will come here. Okay, so this is the main idea that if you perform spectral reversal, the corresponding uh, frequency domain will be flipped left to right instead of top to bottom. Now, what, what do we actually have to do? For example, in case of spectral inversion, we perform one minus something. But in this case, what are we doing? So that is what we are going to talk about now. This second method of converting low pass to high pass. In this case, what we are actually doing is we are changing the alternate samples. Okay, so by every other sample, we mean the alternate samples. We are changing the sign of the alternate samples in A. By A, we mean this. Okay, so and this will have the effect in the corresponding frequency domain. The effect will be it will be flipped left for right, not top to bottom, left for right. So this is an important point. So in the previous case, what we did is uh, in case of spectral inversion, we multiplied this whole thing with minus one. That means all of these things just got inverted and then we added one with the uh, middle point. But in this case, what we are doing is we are not multiplying with minus one with everything. We are performing this minus one multiplication with the uh, with every alternate point. Okay. So if you perform, so if it is like what can it be from like there are a bunch of zeros you can think of it in, if we take a small window of it you can think that there are zeros then some one two then one zero okay so there is some minus one then again zero then it gradually increases there are some values here some high values here suppose we are thinking of them as one then two then three then four then three two one then zero then this part again here in the right part okay so if we just uh, think of this thing in the value wise array it should be something like this okay just take it for simplicity that this is the case in that case if we perform spectral reversal what will happen this will just perform a negation of the alternate points okay so this one it will keep as it is this one it, it will change again this one it will keep as it is this one it will change so it will be one minus two then one zero zero then this will keep as it is this will change this will keep as it is then this will change minus two then three then minus four so this is what will actually happen in the corresponding array after spectral reversal okay so you're just performing minus one multiplication with the alternate uh, suppose all even samples you are multiplying it with. So in that case, if you if you do this in the corresponding frequency domain, you will see something like this of uh, flipping of whatever the frequency response was in the previous case, it will be just flipped left or right. Okay. So that is spectral reversal. So now changing the sign of every other sample is equivalent to multiplying the filter kernel by a sinusoid with a frequency of 0.5 okay so as we have just said what actually happens in the frequency domain is it gets flipped left for right and this flipping effect can also be gotten by by multiplying with a sinusoid with the frequency of 0.5 if you just took this if you just took this uh, frequency domain and you multiplied it with a sinusoid uh, of 0.5 frequency then you would also get this so so that is what they are saying that if you perform this operation in the time domain that is multiply minus one with alternate samples in the corresponding frequency domain this is equivalent to multiplying with a sinusoid of 0.5 frequency okay because multiplying with a sinusoid of 0.5 frequency will also give the same effect flip left for right okay so this is what they are saying and we have also discussed about this in the previous chapter in uh, ft properties i think yeah chapter 10 ft properties so this has the effect of shifting the frequency domain by 0.5. So shifting in the time domain and shifting in the frequency domain is a is obviously different, and it is very difficult to understand the shifting in the frequency domain. But just uh, know that uh, multiplying uh, with something in the uh, multiplying with the sinusoid will perform some shifting in the frequency domain. Okay, and how can we actually get one from the other simply by shifting? So if we look at B and we can we can imagine the negative frequencies to the left okay so the main thing here is this thing 
so how did we actually get this from uh, how did we get this from this if you notice that uh, dft does not show us the negative frequencies right it only shows us from 0 to 0.5 of the frequencies but uh, theoretically there are some negative frequencies here as well right we talked about it in the previous chapter uh, how the frequency domain actually sees the the periodicity of the frequency domain so sees it like like this okay so uh, the, uh, there are some negative frequencies that will be a mirror of the positive frequencies and it will be like this so if you think of these frequencies and uh, if you shift them so just think of this window we on, we are only seeing this window here after performing dft but we are not seeing this window right we are not seeing this window if you take this window if you take this whole signal and shift it to the right in such a way that this window comes here okay so this window will come here similarly this window will go out of this window so we won't be seeing this signal anymore the, this current signal that we have here we are not going to be seeing it because it is going to be pushed to the right and out of the, our window and this left window will come to our visible window when this happens this is what we get right so this is how we are actually getting uh, the uh, effect in the frequency domain okay so multiplying minus one with the alternate samples is equivalent to multiplying a frequent uh, sinusoid with frequency 0.5 which is also equivalent to shifting the frequency domain to the right by n by two samples right uh, uh, for example this was n by two samples we, we were getting we were showing here before so if we shift these n by two samples to the right and so the negative n by two samples will come here so notice that all of these things will will disappear the, these things that we have and the left things will come here so this is how we are going to get this so just notice that flipping left for right is equivalent to shift a kind of shift operation right so these are all connected in some way so that is what we are basically saying here and lastly the figures 14.8 and 14.9 show how low pass and high pass filter kernels can be combined to form band pass and band reject so all this time we have been saying how you can get high pass from low pass also you can get band pass and band reject from by combining this and we can see that from figures 14.8 and 14.9 so 14.8 okay so this one shows us how we can get band pass filter and the band reject filter is here okay 14.9 and this one shows how we can get band reject filter from these two from combining low pass and high pass so notice that uh, adding the filter kernels adding low pass with high pass gives us band reject and convolving performing convolution between them produces band pass okay and even though i haven't marked it but they are actually based on the way cascaded and parallel systems behave are, are combined and we have actually talked about this before in the uh, properties of convolution chapter the cascading and parallel systems also in the previous book in uh, proagis book we also talked about cascaded and parallel systems okay so notice that this is a cascading system right we are performing a series of filtering at first we perform low pass filtering okay and then we pass the result to a high pass filter the ultimate result will have the behavior of a as if it got band passed uh, so the combined effect of low pass and high pass is a band pass operation this one allows the low frequencies to pass this one allows the high frequencies to pass so when you convolute them you get the whichever one passes both so high pass allows this uh, these are the ones that are uh, in common with the low pass also in in case of the low pass uh, these are the these particular ones are the ones that are in common with the high pass so only this particular band will be passed okay and the rest of them will be blocked one will be blocked by high pass and the uh, higher frequencies here will be blocked by the low pass okay? so the combined effect of them is a band pass filter this is what we will get when we perform cascading of them but if we perform uh, addition of them such as here if you uh, connect them in parallel then the corresponding addition of the result will give us a band reject filters and uh, how do we actually get a band reject filter uh, the effect of band reject filter from uh, adding low pass and high pass remember that low pass and high pass are all what can i say they are inversions of each other so if we have uh, an inverted 
frequency domain what do we actually have in the that means their phase are uh, different right so remember how we defined how you can add to uh, complex numbers so these are all complex complex numbers right so how do you add two complex numbers and what do you actually get adding two numbers in uh, in the polar notation is easier remember we talked about this in the previous chapter that uh, adding two numbers in the polar notation is easier because their uh, magnitudes will simply get uh, not polar notation in the rectangular notation in the re rectangular notation addition is easier because you just add the real with the real real plus real and imaginary plus imaginary okay so this is easier in the rectangular notation but in the polar notation this is difficult why you cannot just add two magnitudes the, because the magnitudes will get added when their phases are same but if their phases are inverted that means if, if there is a phase difference of 180 degree then addition means actually subtraction their magnitudes will get subtracted so in this case this is just simply addition with real plus real imaginary plus imaginary but in polar form you perform magnitude plus magnitude magnitude plus magnitude when phase is zero okay but if phase is minus 180 then you perform magnitude minus magnitude so it is, there is a minus here between them so actually what happens here is that since low pass and high pass filters have a, a phase difference of 180 since they are flipped versions of each other they will have a phase difference of 180 so what will happen is when you add them together when you perform a parallel parallelization of them the actual result will be you are actually performing a negation of one with the other so if you perform negation what will you get the you'll get a simply a band rigid filter right so whichever one this one was passing uh, and whichever one this one was passing those two things will get uh, negated and the rest of the things will remain right so this is how we can get a band reject filter from low pass and high pass by parallelization and we have already said how you can get a band pass filter by convolution of these two okay so now we move on to the last topic of this chapter that is filter classification the use of a digital filter can be broken into three categories time domain frequency domain and custom okay, and we have already discussed previously that time domain filters are used when information is encoded and in the time domain that is in the shape of the signals waveform and what are the uh, examples of some of the applications where we, we can use time domain filters so these are the cases okay so comment this to memory that smoothing dc removal waveform shaping these are some of the examples where we will focus on the time domain parameters okay so you remember what the time domain parameters are in that case we'll be mainly tuning the step response right so this is, these are the cases where we'll be tuning the step response and in contrast the frequency domain filters are used when information is contained in the uh, amplitude frequency and phase of the component sinusoids that means information is encoded in the frequency domain so in this case the goal is to separate one band of frequencies from another so just like we have said in what kind of scenarios we'll be using it high pass low pass band pass band reject these are all examples of uh, band pass filters and there is another kind of filter called the custom filters and the applications of them are actually uh, specialized so something more elaborate than four basic responses instead of just high pass low pass band pass and band reject they may have some other applications some uh, uh, combination of them or some other hybrid applications combining both time domain and frequency domain parameters those are called custom filters and an example of them is already given here deconvolution a way of counteracting an unwanted convolution this is an example of where we will need a custom filter and here we can have a, a table is given where it is shown some of the examples of all three of them time domain filters moving average filter is an example of a time domain time domain filter then windowed sync filter i've already just mentioned its name before in this uh, today, in today's lecture so this is an example of a frequency domain filter and its be, uh, its usefulness is in case of separating frequencies this one's usefulness is in smoothing okay and the fir custom this one is useful for deconvolution so these are just examples and there are some other recursion versions so these are convolution filters and there are some corresponding recursion 
filters that will also that are also useful in time domain frequency domain and custom so these are examples of those single pole for in, ca in case of time domain Chebyshev in case of frequency domain and iterative design in case of custom so uh, just remember their names but not all of them are important in the next chapter in the up upcoming chapters we will only be talking about these two the moving average and window C. and this one is useful in the time domain this one is useful in the frequency domain the rest of them will not be discussing in our course but uh, just know their names that they are useful in these kinds of scenarios okay so just as i've said the upcoming chapters will will be discussing these two things okay in chapter 15 we have the moving average and in chapter 16 we have the window sync so that will be all for our class today thank you everyone for your attention